it's the policy of the magazine not to do bad reviews. And the, the, the principle is that if, if, if it's an okay piece and worthy of printing, you know, you write a little bit. And if it's a, a really good piece, then write a little bit more. And if you think it's going to find its way into the, uh, into the repertoire, you give it that reviewer's choice. And they tell us not to do too many of those a year. So if you don't like a piece, uh, we just don't review it, you know. And I think for for our role in the in the music world or the music community, I think that's the way to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the good fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio-on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you knew one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now on to my next guest, John Thompson. Hi, John. Good morning. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm fine. I'm sitting here in my dining room with my Labrador waiting for your phone call. Excellent. John, it's so nice to talk to you. I, I know you by reputation, and um, I've had the, the honor of having a piece interv- uh, reviewed by you in The Instrumentalist, and I heard your interview with Don Stinson on the Bandmasters podcast, and I knew that I had to have you on the show. Oh, well, thank you. I enjoyed doing that podcast. That was the first experience of that kind that I'd ever had. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, uh, it was interesting, and I've been looking forward to talking with you as well. Excellent, excellent. So, John, can you um, quickly introduce yourself for my listeners so they know who you are, for maybe those who don't know your name? Sure. Well, um, I was the band director uh, at New Trier High School in Winnetka, Illinois, for 25 years. And I think a lot of people know me through that. Uh, before I taught at New Trier, I taught for 13 years at East Allegheny High School, which is in suburban Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, those are the two significant high school positions that I held during my career. And so on the teaching side of things, I think that's how most people know me. Um I have also had a long time association with the Instrumentalist magazine. And uh, intro to that with this story, I was a doctoral student at Northwestern University, and I was a teaching assistant for John Painter, who was then the director of bands. And John called me into his office one day, and in his sort of semi sarcastic voice, he said, you're a doctoral student. You can probably write, can't you? Ha ha. And he said he wanted me to join the uh, the staff at the Instrumentalist. And at that time, ta- uh, John was one of the reviewers. In fact, he was the head reviewer. So that was more than 35 years ago. And so I've been doing new music reviews for them for, for those many years. And as a contributing editor, I also do interviews and write articles for them. So I still do this, even though I'm in my 50th year in the profession, uh, I still do do music reviews and, and, uh, and articles. You've had quite a storied career. So now you, um, prior to new Trier, you were in, in Pennsylvania. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania and went to North Hills high school uh, North Hills was one of those iconic 
Pennsylvania high schools. They performed at the Midwest six or seven times with Warren Mercer, who was a, one of my mentors, but also uh, a fabulous bandman. And uh, one of my teachers taught at Carnegie Mellon University in the city, so it was a logical transition to graduate from high school and go to Carnegie Mellon. And uh, Dr. Richard Strange was the director of bands there. Most people know Dick through uh, Arizona State because he went out there and had a fabulous career and past president of the American Band Masters Association, you know, a storied bandsman in his own right. Um, but he was my college band director. And uh, so then uh, this is another story, you know, we all have our stories, but he called me into his office <laughs> one time and he said, I have an appoint appointment for you at four o'clock, go home, shave, take a shower and be there by four o'clock. Well, the interview was with the supervisor of music at East Allegheny High School and I was subsequently hired and did 13 years there. Um, including, by the way, a uh, performance at the Midwest. Uh, most people know me through my Midwest performances with New Trier, but uh, many forget that in 76, I had my Pennsylvania band at uh, the Midwest Clinic here in Chicago, and uh, that still is one of my great memories, uh, career memories. What instrument do you play, and how did you get started as a child? I was a trumpet player originally because my daddy was. Uh, he he played in the Pittsburgh Salvation Army Band and was a part-time band director. And uh, uh, I think when it was time for me to play a musical instrument, it was going to be trumpet. Um, interestingly enough, I came home from school in fourth grade with a trombone, and my dad got in the car and drove me back to school and said, no, no, he's not going to be a trombone player. He's going to be a trumpet player. Well, the irony of that moment was that as a sophomore, it was decided that I was really better suited embouchure-wise and in many ways better suited to the trombone than the trumpet. So my dad had to swallow hard. And I finally became that trombone player <laughs> that they wanted to make me back in fourth grade. But it had a lot to do with the uh, embouchure, you know, teeth and lips and, you know, all the stuff that goes into it. So I, I think my temperament, to be honest, was also more of a trombone player than a trombone player. That my trombone community feels more like my community than the band than the trumpet community ever did sure sure it's it's there's there's some nuggets in that story that speak to our profession as band directors right about maybe the 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 expertise that we have, but the maybe some somehow well, you know, you've taught a long time how some parents may not necessarily respect that expertise quite the way they should. <laughs> Well, my dad should have appreciated the the, uh, the teachers there at fourth grade because they they saw something, you know. And for him, it was for him. It wanted my dad just wanted to to play duets. In fact, you know, talk about life experiences. You know, some guys, uh, you know, go play catch with their dad or go fishing with their dad. Uh, my dad and I play trumpet duets together. You know, th that's one of the ways we bonded. And uh, I would not trade any of those early years of playing trumpet duets on Sunday afternoon for anything in this world. Uh, eventually, they had to become trumpet trombone duets. But, uh, <laughs> but we started out on trumpet. Cornet, actually, to be honest, it wasn't even a trumpet. It was a, a cornet, an old king cornet, which oh, wow. I still own, by the way. Is it a good instrument? Fabulous instrument. You know, it it was uh, the bell was fairly ornate and it had a gold bell. It's a silver instrument. And uh, I, I don't know whether they'd use it in a symphony orchestra you know, or even a brass band. Uh, so I, I better qualify good. It was it was a good instrument in its time, and 
but I had it a, a redone for my dad when he was still alive. Uh, we stuck it out of the house and had it completely refurbished and uh, presented it to him on his birthday. And it was one of the few times I ever saw my father cry. So I know it meant a lot to him. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's it's so important. I mean, I, I can't imagine my kids are, are just now they're seven and eight. They're playing piano. They're going to start. My daughter's actually getting her first recorder today. And I told her that we'll play when she comes home. You know, because I'll pull mine out for my music ed class days 25 uh, years ago. And <laughs> I, I just very love, cool. I love that story of you playing duets with your father. I think there's so much musicianship and so much to learn as a child that way. He was a fairly good trumpet player. You know, he had to come up through the Arbenz book and had all the technical stuff down. And um, we would play until my embouchure hurt. <laughs> Mm -hmm, <laughs> sure. Then he'd say, come on, one more. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So then you um, you mentioned that you went to high school and then you ended up at Carnegie Mellon. And you talked about your first job at East Allegheny and how you brought that band to Midwest. And I know that you then brought um, the new Trier band to Midwest a couple of times, correct? Yes. So, I, you know, I, I want to talk about your experiences as a band director, and I want to make sure that we circle back to this notion of you being able to bring two different bands to Midwest, because I think that speaks to something about what you're doing as a teacher. And so I kind of wanted to ask you about your programs at the schools. What, how did you sort of structure everything to create that excellence? Well, um, they were very different uh, because East Allegheny was actually the product of a jointure. Uh, jointures were something that was happening in Pennsylvania back in the late 60s where they were taking smaller school districts and in the name of efficiency, uh, putting them together. And some of them worked and some of them were horrible disasters where they would bring communities together that wouldn't and couldn't come together. East Allegheny was one of the success stories because there were three or four small districts that came together. And as I arrived in the fall of 1967, there was a new high school planned and, uh, you know, there was a lot uh, that was forward thinking and new with the new building and everything. And the staff had come together from the smaller schools two years before I got there. And so we had a pretty good staff in place, and the music supervisor, Mr. Torino, who was my uh, the person who hired me, um, he he had a vision, and he said to me shortly after I was hired that he said we're going to the Midwest Clinic in Chicago over these dates, and I had never been to the clinic. And uh, like so many other people, we got to the Midwest and I had one of those gee golly gosh moments where the entire profession was there for me to see. And my eyes were opened. I was hearing these fabulous ensembles. And I said to myself, could I ever possibly have a band good enough <laughs> to play on that stage? And, uh, of course, I, I was able to, but, you know, at that time, it was uh, um, something that just seemed so far away that it could not happen. Uh, back to the story. Um, so Mr. Torino and I had a shared vision, and uh, the structure was that there was one band in the high school, and then there was a small group, more of an ensemble than a band uh, as a, it wasn't big enough to be a second band, but but um, uh, I had to put a curriculum in place for them. But what I had at East Allegheny, which was very special, were, were pull-out classes where on a rotating schedule, meaning, you know, one week it would be first period, then the second week it would be second period, and that kind of stuff, uh, like by like instrument. And so I built a curriculum that would take the students through uh, fundamentals and things like that um, as the, the year unfolded. And since they were like groups, you know, like I'd have four or five clarinets, and then I'd have three or four trumpets, and then I'd have a uh, percussion section, you know, that kind of stuff. I was able to do a lot of 
technique and fundamental development outside uh, outside of rehearsal. And that was important in that school because not everybody studied privately. You know, I've been asked over time, you know, what is a model for success when the kids can't afford private lessons? Well, I had that pull-up session, which was able to, uh, to, to make up a lot. And then over the years, more and more kids started uh, studying privately as the program started to develop the kids' awareness started to develop, and uh, I was able to use a lot of Carnegie Mellon University um, people, um, students sometimes, grad students would come out and do the lessons at school and things like that. And I had Thursday night rehearsals. Uh, we had a two-hour rehearsal every Thursday night. Um, in marching season, it was, of course, marching band, and then after that, it became you know concert band. Uh, in terms of performances, we did four performances a year uh, that were main performances. One was Winter Festival, so it was a shared experience with the other ensembles, but the others were all mine. And I started a, an invitational program, which I brought to New Trier later. I'll talk about that when I talk about New Trier. Uh, that's just basically inviting guests to come in and things like that. Uh, so. I don't, I don't, would you like me to go more deeply into that than I have? The main thing I'm trying to get to is is what you know how we, your philosophy is about teaching, and this is sort of telling me a lot about who you are as a band, who you were as a band director, and are. Well, uh, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, in terms of this, more or less comes under the category of advice, I suppose. Uh, uh, and since I do, a, I observe student teachers for a number of universities. I guess I'm in the business of giving advice with the young young teachers anymore. But, you know, one thing is to uh, play quality repertoire. Uh, I have concerns about our business because people seem to want to play what's new all the time. And while I recognize the importance of, of uh, commissioning and, and writing new music, I, I would want us not to forget the the repertoire that has stood the test of time. And and I tell all of my young charges that, that, you know, play quality repertoire and do a mix and match. You know, you bring in new pieces so that your own repertoire is always growing, but return to those pieces uh, that are important from time to time. In fact, Mr. Painter, uh, John Painter, gave me important advice in that score. Uh, I asked him one time, in our doctoral seminar, I said, you know, I'm starting to repeat repertoire. Is that a concern? And he looked at me and said, it is not. He said, it's, it's showing your own maturity. You know, when you come back to Lincolnshire Posey, the third and fourth and fifth time, you're bringing more to the music than you did the first time, which means your students are getting more from the music than they would have without you, the experience that you bring. To me, and you know, I am, I'm a little bit biased, but one of the strengths to me of the band community is the dynamism and is the new music and, and sort of the fresh ideas that are constantly coming into it. But there's a there's definitely a balance, as you mentioned. And um, do you have any thoughts about how to balance that? When When is it too much of the new or too much of the old? Or do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, a, uh, a store owner who will go on name told me that he knows back in the day of band directors who would come in and pick up everything that was new and go home with about eight or ten pieces, and that would be their curriculum for the year. And uh, I, I think that's too much. I think, you know, I've commissioned 15 pieces of music, so obviously I believe in, you know, in, you know, finding composers, having music written for band, the art form is moving forward and developing, and, and it's an exciting art form right now because there's such wonderful, wonderful repertoire being written. Uh, but I think as teachers, I think we have to be well-rooted. You know, if I'm teaching English, I I'm not teaching books that have been written in the last three years. I'm making sure that, uh, you know, Tale of Two Cities is talked about and uh, things like that. So it's a balancing. Um, it it to put a number on it, I would say that I tried to have one, quote, contemporary 
unquote, piece on every concert. One piece that was new, maybe two, but most of the repertoire would be works that have been around for a while, including transcriptions. I, I know a lot of band directors don't go there anymore, but I still think there's a lot to be said for Festive Overture by Shostakovich uh, and other pieces like that. It seems like the the argument about transcriptions or the controversy about transcriptions bubbles up every few years and then goes away and then bubbles up again. It seems like this has been a cyclical kind of thing. Agreed. One more thought about repertoire. You know, obviously the repertoire that you select should be technically appropriate for your ensemble. But I don't think if you're a grade four band, you have to play every piece at grade four level. You know, I, I, I would always have a couple of what I called stretchers on my program, pieces that would be at the technical frontier, but I also would include repertoire that wasn't at their technical frontier, but was music that we could digest rather quickly and arrive on stage with it still feeling fresh. I also think that there should be a broad historical base, and that's why I do transcriptions. There's certain style periods that are just not available to us. And I love uh, much of the music that was written by Bach transcribed. What comes to mind is the Molman transcriptions of all the prelude and fugues. Uh, There's so much wonderful teaching that can be done. And I also think we should do varied structures, forms, and textures. You know, every piece shouldn't be ABA. You know, why not? Uh, uh, theme and variations. Why not, you know, prelude and fugue? And uh, and lastly, I think there should be unit study compositions. And what I mean by that are pieces that you choose for extended study. And I did a clinic not too long ago uh, where I used variations on the Korean folk song as by John Barnes' chance as my model. And I said, you can learn the second trombone part to variations on a Korean folk song, perform it, and feel good about it. But you can also learn about pentatonic scale. You can learn about theme and variation form. You can learn about melodic inversion. You can learn about retrograde inversion. You can learn about augmentation, diminution, and the list goes on. And so if you take a piece like the variations on a Korean folk song, a movement from the Hindemith Symphony, or some important work, and study it over a longer period of time and learn more about it than the notes required to play it, I think you're being a better teacher. Yeah, that that speaks to that comprehensive musicianship idea. Exactly. And I was, uh, I cut my teeth on that because, uh, you know, Bennett Reamer, of course, was at Northwestern and we had a deep immersion experience into that. In fact, I wrote a paper uh, in school in, in the doctor program on it. So I've known about the, the comprehensive musician approach, uh, the comprehensive musicianship approach for years, and I used it in my teaching. Let's talk about your time at New Trier, and I want to hear more about the chamber music and the sight reading. Sure. Well, what happened, um, I was at my second year of doctoral studies at uh, Northwestern University, where I was a PA with John, John Painter. And this is a similar story. You, you will chuckle at it because John, again, called me into his office <laughs> <laughs> and he said, um, he said, you're looking for college jobs, right? And th- at that time I was, I was coming off the two years of doctoral study and I was thinking about maybe moving on to university. And he said, there's a little school down the road. I think you ought to take a look at. And uh, of course that's new to high school, which, which is the next district North after where, uh, Northwestern University. Northwestern's in Evanston. Many people would know that. Well, the next set of communities along the lake uh, are Nutria Township, and that's Winnetka, Wilmette, and all of those. But they, they're called North Shore communities because they're upper scale and they're along the lake. So at any rate, um, I went and interviewed for that job and got the job. And of course, I stayed for 25 years. 
Um, and it was an interesting situation, too, because New Trier had been two high schools. It had been New Trier East and New Trier West, and they played each other in uh, athletics and things like that. And I arrived one year after the two schools came together. And so they had to select one football coach from two and, you know, one band director from two and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it, um, it was an interesting time in Nutra's history. But what happened is there, there was a lot of energy, just like at East Allegheny uh, when the jointure happened. There was a lot of energy bringing these two staffs together. And we had four curricular bands. We had four curricular jazz ensembles. We had four curricular orchestras, including an early bird orchestra that met before school, and a plethora of choirs. So there was a lot of uh, interest in music uh, of all kinds at New Trier. And we were on a nine-period day with an early bird. So that means there were 10 curricular periods if you count the early bird, which gave kids an opportunity to play in more than one large ensemble. So they could play in band and jazz ensemble, or they could play in in one of the wind ensembles and uh, uh, orchestra, wind section, and things like that. Uh, but the sacrifice for a nine-period day was it was a 40-minute class, and anybody who would be listening to this podcast knows that instrumental music in 40 minutes can be a challenge because, of course, there's warm-up, tune-up, arrival, departure, and all of the other stuff that goes into a class period happening in 40 minutes. So that was a continuing a challenge. The first time Mr. Painter came out to run a rehearsal, he came into class and he spent several minutes talking about me <laughs> because I was had been his TA, and he did a little bit of warm up and tune up and he looked at me and I said, well, you have five minutes. <laughs> he hadn't even started a piece yet. So it was like, you really have to get used to teaching in a 40 minute class. Yeah. It's so funny that 40 minutes, it's a matter of perspective though. I have to say I teach fourth grade beginners and yesterday, 45 minutes seemed like an eternity in that class, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but with my middle school, it never feels like enough. I hear that. You I know, that. I, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah. For fourth graders, forty-five minutes, they, it pushes the the limits of their uh, patience, I guess, as nine-year-olds. So <laughs> now, at, at New Trier, I did not have pull-out classes or anything like that, like I had at East Allegheny. So I had to get things done very differently. <clears throat> what I did have, though, is a fairly affluent community. And probably 95% of my students studied privately with good teachers. We had a staff of private teachers who would come into the school during the day to offer lessons when kids had free periods. And, um, and so fundamentals were being addressed in those private lessons. And uh, uh, any teacher who says that you, can, you don't stand on the shoulders of your private teachers is being less than honest. But back to the uh, sight reading component, um, I, I felt that I had to have a constant array of music going through their eyes and minds. And so we would sight read often, and there was intent to it. I would start out at the beginning of the year with grade one and grade two music. Now, this was a, my top band out of four. Now, I did it with the other bands, too, but I'm, I'll, I'm addressing the top one. And um, the kids at first would say, well, Mr. Thompson, these are whole notes and half notes. We could play these. And I said, yes, but can you play them in tune? Can you play them with good tone? Can you have a unified articulation? You know, you go down the list. And so... Then after a few weeks, we'd go to grade two and the grade three and so forth. And I want to tell you, by the end of the year, I could put something like uh, symphonic dance number three in front of them, and they could pretty much read it down. And uh, maybe it wasn't always pretty, but, but they learned that skill of, uh, of um, keeping keep going. You know, like everybody who say reads knows, sometimes you just have to don't lose your way. You know, and uh, And so... 
by going through so much music, I think I was developing their literacy. And then the chamber music, what we did, uh, we could not do it curricularly, but we encouraged the students to form chamber ensembles that were often friendship-based. Um, you know, if you were a brass player and you had other buddies who played uh, brass instruments, start a brass quartet, you know, that kind of thing. And so they would rehearse at home. In fact, I've had stories of uh, the parents would tell me, oh, yeah, Thursday night was uh, brass quartet night at our house. Everybody, you know, the kids came over and they practiced. And, of course, I would coach them after school if they wanted me to coach them you know, by appointment. And then I, after a while, I had older players who could do some of the coaching and they would coach the younger ones. And then as a motivational tool, we had a solo and ensemble festival at our school every spring. And the students then could use that as something to look towards to participating in the solo and ensemble festival. And I brought in local band directors to do the adjudication and it really became something quite special. Then two weeks later, uh, the North shore concert band with in association with Northwestern university would have a solo and ensemble festival and the kids were encouraged to go over there. Some of them did both. Some of them would pick and choose because the date was better for them or whatever, but they were all encouraged to do one of them. And if they did, then they got credit and, uh, you know, for the activity. And uh, that was my way of encouraging musical independence. Uh, and that goes all the way back to my own college experience. Some of my most satisfying musical experiences in college were playing brass quintet. You know, I had a group that we were together for three or four years. There was no conductor. We were reacting to each other. And that comes down to one of my other beliefs about an ensemble being basically a large chamber ensemble, basically, uh, you know, approach it like that rather than like a, an aggregate. So, John, this is, um, you know, you, you started, and I don't want to, <laughs> I hope this comes out correctly, but you started teaching in 1967. So you have a huge wealth of experience over several generations of, of the band community. And um, you talked about a couple things that, um, as the one thing you said to me that really struck me was feeling overwhelmed at Midwest the first time. And then you mentioned that you mentor student teachers or that you observe student teachers. What do you say to a young teacher that's feeling overwhelmed? And, and you know, how do you, how do you encourage them to get over that feeling of fear? Not necessarily fear, but that that I'm trying to get it out. I'm trying to get the word out that that they will be successful, that it's just that patience. What do you say to them? Well, you know, that comes up almost every year now because I observe student teachers for mm -hmm. uh, right. Northwestern, and I have observed for University of Illinois and Roosevelt University here in town. So uh, that comes up almost every year. Um, you know, the veneer of a senior in college falls away rather quickly when you put them in front of a school classroom because all of a sudden they're dealing with uh, – with class management issues and things like that, that they did not have to deal with when they were in their uh, seminars in college. But, uh, you know, this may sound over simplistic, but I would say to them, Rome was not built in a day, you know, you, that it, it takes time. Um, you know, the way I developed the East Allegheny program with the help of many, by the way, and the, certainly New Trier had never played a Midwest or MENC or, or any of the things we did during those years. Uh, it just wasn't something that they considered. And so, again, Rome wasn't built in the day. Uh, you just take your time and you develop a curriculum. You put the emphasis on fundamentals and uh, – you know, and by the way, I might digress, but talking about fundamentals for a minute, we're in the sound business. You know, we paint silence, I think somebody said one time, but uh, uh, we're in the sound business, so there's nothing more important than tone. And so I think a lot of young teachers don't want to take the time to develop that, that they want to play lots of notes and, and they're busy, you know, doing those things. 
but it's the raw material that's taught every day, and you find as many ways to teach that as you can. And of course, you can't talk about tone without breathing because your tone is only as good as your last breath. So, I mean, it's uh, the, it's that emphasis on fundamentals and. If there was one thing that got my East Allegheny band to uh, to the Midwest in the fall of '76 was the the, the, the constant, insistent uh, expectation of fundamentals, and that goes from embouchure to breathing to fingers, uh, where the fingers go on the instruments, you know, how uh, how you hold the instrument, all of those things. Now there are probably other answers to that question, but that's that's the one that that came to my mind. John, I want to ask about the commissions that you did. You mentioned that you did fifteen commissions over the course of your career. What was the value for your program and for your students through those commissions? It was fabulous. Uh, I'll back up because the high school program that I attended have done nearly forty commissions over the years. And so I think I was predisposed to want to commission music for my band and to have the opportunity to do the world premiere. And I did one commission when I was uh, uh, in Pittsburgh and that I got my, uh, uh, my interest whetted in working with the composer, having him come in and talk to my students. He was not a podium type composer, but he talked with the students and he knew there's nobody in the planet who knew more about that piece of music than he did because he put it, he threw it, you know, and there's an excitement in the classroom when the composer arrives because the kids are so anxious to hear why did you write this piece? Why did you make this choice? Uh, where did the melody come from? And uh, I wanted that for my new cheer kids. And again, I had the financial resources to um, to do this. I won't spend much time on it because on the other on another podcast, I did spend time on how we financed it. So I, I, unless you want to go there, I won't. But. Um, I was able to get the funds to do 15 commissions, starting with the Robert Smith Commission in Africa. But I've had a number of composers. Now, I did not go for composers, uh, like I would not have commissioned John Mackey. I would have not commissioned a composer who was already established and coveted by so many others. I was more interested in young composers. And for a couple of reasons, one, honestly, they were less expensive, but uh, also you have that young energy that comes into the room. Now, as I said a moment ago, some of them jump right on the podium and, and would take a rehearsal and do beautifully. Others would choose not to. Others would say, no, no, let me listen. And then I will, you know, talk to you about the piece and, and that kind of stuff. I even had a couple of residencies where, the school was able to bring somebody in and they went to our theory classes and they went to some of our other music classes and talked to the kids. And, and so I got a lot out of that composer over the day or two that they were in residence at, at the, uh, at the school, but mostly it was the, uh, the, their passion and their knowledge of the score and their, insights into the compositional process. Those were probably the, the three main threads. Another thing that you mentioned was um, that you really encouraged private lessons and, and you brought up funding for um, the commissions. And that was on the Bandmasters podcast that you talked about that for my listeners. Yeah, that, yes. Okay, if they want to listen to that, that's by Don Stintz and his podcast. But how how, do, how are you able to encourage private lessons and encourage the, the raising of funds for commissions? What was the, what was the secret sauce? Because I know that, that funding is a big issue for a lot of directors. Well, um, my undergraduate institution um, needed pianos. And so they instituted a buy a key. Now, there are 88 keys on a piano, 
So they broke the cost of a piano down by 88 and alumni and others were able to buy, you know, contribute whatever you can. So it was tremendously successful and they were able to pretty much replace all of the old Story and Clarks with better instruments. So I thought, well, wait a minute, I can do that by a bar, by a measure. So what, what I did is I instituted a buy a bar and I put a dollar amount on it, like $5 or whatever it was, estimating how much money, if the commission was 5000 or 1500 or whatever it was, I, I would break it down. And then some parents would buy two bars, three bars, four bars, and then there would be a more affluent parent who would buy 50 bars, you know, and what happened, it was so successful that I would oversell and I'd have to tell people that we've already paid off the commission. And so I put it in my band fund to fund the next commission. And it was it was incredibly successful, simply by a bar. And I know as a result of that first podcast, at least two people who use the idea because they have told me so <laughs> with, with success. Um, back to the private lessons, though. I think when students start to understand the skill sets involved to play a, a musical instrument, uh, then it, it seems like a short distance to, well, why do you study with somebody who's an expert? And again, it wasn't quite a short story for East Allegheny because of finances, but, but when you think about what people pay today for dance lessons and for other kinds of activities, even pay to play sports, a private lesson was, you know, pretty inexpensive relative to other expenses that people might have. And to be quite honest, I, I, I never, it, I didn't have to promote it. It just seemed like, oh, I want to study. <laughs> and before you know it, everybody was studying. And, you know, I had certain teachers that, that they, they studied with who came into the school who we basically hired on a contract basis. Um, we also had scholarships, by the way, Mark, uh, so who kids who said that they could not afford uh, private lessons, we had a scholarship program that would offset uh, some of the expenses. And we got it done by having our Fine Arts Association do fundraising, and we asked the private teachers to give a little bit. In other words, if the lesson was $25 to only charge 20 or something like that. And, and so we were able then to help those kids, you know, homes with multiple fam or multiple siblings or dads out of work or, or whatever, you know, if they, they couldn't afford it, we could help them out. And then, you know, don't forget, we were in the shadow of Northwestern University. In fact, the little joke, uh, I, I don't know how your listeners will respond to this, but the kids would laughingly call Northwestern University New Trier South. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's that's something only a high school kid could say, right? <laughs> <laughs> only a high school kid could say Right, it. right. But I would laugh. I mean, part of it was because of my own association there, and there were other faculty who had associations there. And we'd gone over for Solo Ensemble Festival, and Mr. Painter would come up to guest conduct. So there were lots of ways that we could use the resources. You know, a lot of my kids would go to the chair program in the summer and study. Uh, uh, and so then they would come home with their own associations and stuff like that. So I, I, I feel in some way I'm giving you an unsatisfying answer to that lesson or to that question, but, but it, it just seemed the kids wanted to. Part of it was, I think, that they wanted to play in a higher band or a higher jazz ensemble or a higher orchestra. Because when the kids came into the program, they all went into what was called freshman band. And then every spring, they would audition for the next level. 
And so a typical schedule might be your sophomore year, you would be in varsity wind ensemble, and then your junior year, you would be in concert wind ensemble, and then your senior year, you would be in symphonic wind ensemble. But there were always freshmen who wanted to be in the top band by their sophomore year. And by the way, Mark, there were seniors who never played in the top band, including one of my children. And the way we made that work, because I was told they'll drop. If you if they don't get into that top band, they're going to quit. Well, you know what? They don't. If you make every band a viable experience, if you give everybody a off campus experience, if if the faculty member arrives in the classroom prepared and excited about what they're doing, they don't quit. Mm-hmm. Sounds to me the answer that you gave me is that it came down to building a culture of excellence. Well, I guess without using those words, that's what we did. Remember your first term of teaching? Learning all the skills that you don't get taught in music school? Managing a transitioning culture in your classroom? Finding out that you have to teach guitar this term? During those early years, we found out that leaning on a community of music educators was important, not only for building that knowledge in ourselves, but also maintaining enough sanity to serve the students right in front of us. Amused is a podcast centered around a community of music teachers. Between the four of us, we teach choir, band, orchestra, general, jazz, and marching band at the elementary through collegiate levels. We certainly don't have all the answers, but you're welcome to listen in while we try to find them. Join us while we work through the challenges of music teaching and celebrate the joy of bringing music making into the lives of young people. In each episode, you'll hear stories, both good and bad, about that week of teaching, and we'll try and tackle an issue that one of us is struggling with. Something we're all taught is that music brings people together, but being the only teacher in your subject at a site can be really isolating. We think everyone ought to be a part of a community, and you're welcome to come join ours. Episodes come out on Wednesdays during the school year, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts and at amusedcast.org. And so, John, I asked the the group of questions um, that are as the final questions of every interview, and they address some of the big issues in the band community right now. And I am especially interested to hear your thoughts with so much experience. And I want to ask a follow up on one of them that's uh, that's going to come up. So we should probably get into these. The first of these questions is: uh, Where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? First of all, I sort of come from the intrinsic motivation family more than the extrinsic motivation, which probably starts my answer. But I think there's competition in music. The people who say there isn't, I think, are deluding themselves. Think about it. If you have chair placement in your band, there's competition. Who's first chair? You know, uh, if you have four bands, What band are you in? If you want to go to honor band or all state band, there's competition. So I I accept the fact that there's competition in music education. Now, to address your question, I think it's healthy when motivated to be the best ensemble or the best you that you can be. In other words, if you're interested in improving yourself or improving your ensemble, I think it's healthy. I think it's unhealthy when it comes down to winning. And and I do have a story for that. I was judging. I do a lot of judging, as you might imagine. And this was some time ago in a state that I will not mention, not Illinois. But uh, we were received, the three judges arrived, and we were received rather nicely by the host school, who, by the way, was one of the very fine schools in this particular region. And uh, the band played beautifully, but another band played beautifully. And that band won the competition, so to speak. They, they were given a higher score. Now, it wasn't a competition about winners and losers, but it was about a score. You know, who would get the 97, who would get the 95, blah, blah, blah. So they were both Division I bands, but one had a higher number. The kids in that band felt like losers. It had nothing to do with the fact that they had played beautifully. They had played very beautifully. But they were losers because their score was two points lower than another band. And and that's my example. I use this when I talk to college classes. That's my example about when 
competition is unhealthy. Uh, if it's about winning, it, it can't be about that. It has to be about self-improvement, competing with yourself, so to speak, or or wanting to be the very best band you can be, the very best you that you can be within the ensemble. Um, Anyhow, that's my judging story, and that and that's where I draw the line between healthy and unhealthy. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. I think it's really also. I believe it's very individual. Some people can do it well with their group. Some people can't, and we have to know what we are good at as directors. Well, absolutely, and I have seen uh, wonderful, wonderful successes where bands sure. are out there competing. Um, we did not compete, believe it or not, at New Trier. There, during my 25 years there, and to this day, by the way, you would never see a New Trier band orchestra or jazz ensemble at a, quote, competition. Now, we would go to places where you would get division ratings and stuff like that, but it was part of the, the philosophy of the department that we would not compete in a winner-loser environment. Just for that reason, we did not want to go down that road. So, John, this is a tricky question, but um, one that I think is really important that we talk about, and it's how do you achieve a work-life balance as a music teacher, or can you? Well, it's not easy. Um, I, I, I knew that question was coming, and I did think about it. Uh, my best answer is it's not easy. Uh, you have to carve out time for self-care. Um, and I think you have to learn to say no. You can't be everything to everybody. And I think a lot of uh, young teachers experience burnout because either they don't want to say no to anything, um, but um, it's it's a tough road. And to be quite honest, I have – my boys are 31 and – 29 now, you know, they're, they're grown men, but, but I, I had to make some very tough choices. Uh, um, I left them for a whole summer to travel around Europe with the Blue Lake Fine Arts International Band. Maybe I should have been at home. You know, my wife said, no, no, do it, you know, but, but it's tough. Uh, I used to do basketball pep band uh, at New Trier for many years. And when the boys were young, I would take them. We'd have a picnic on the floor of my office, and then they would come over to the stadium uh, with with me. And, of course, my high school kids, particularly the, the, the girls in the band, would mother the boys. You know, they, they would bring candy for them and they want them to set with them and they it was a way i could involve my my boys with what i was doing and they eventually all went to high school there so you know it was a logical segue but i i i feel like i'm coming up short because it's very very hard to find that balance um but the best I can do is to, is you have to carve out time for self care. When I got near the end of my career, um, I was doing an adult community band, and I was coming home Wednesday nights after rehearsal, getting in around eleven, then getting up for first period class the next day, and I realized that the, my one major concession to age was resilience. And I wasn't resilient Thursday morning, and I wasn't able to bring the energy that that I needed and wanted to uh, to for the program, because by that time we had created a tiger by the tail, and you know what happens if you let go, the tiger comes back to get you, and if you slow down, it comes back to get you. So I, I had to bring that same energy, and and so I had to give it up, you know, and. Uh, so I guess that's an example of how I was able to, to to make a tough choice, but not easy. I'm sorry. I hope I didn't let you down on that one. No, no. I think that's a perfect answer. My father was a high school athletic director when I was a kid. I spent many a night uh, playing in the bleachers of high school basketball games or behind the bleachers of the football game, you know. So I remember those days. 
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, so, John, the next question is the big question of the interview, but it's intentionally left open-ended to kind of give you a chance to add your thought. And that's uh, what what is a challenge or challenges facing music education band, and how can we best meet it or them? Mm. Well, um, I think relevance is has been and continues to be one of the important challenges facing music education, particularly in a time of testing, when there's a lot of testing going on and schools are reacting to the testing and teaching for the test. You know, where do the fine of performing arts find themselves in that world? And and I think the answer to that that I pose is that we have to be as teachers, as educators, as administrators, we have to be proactive. We have to tell our administrators and our school board members and our parents what we're doing and why we're doing it. You know, call them on the phone and talk with them or ask for an appointment in your superintendent's office. Uh, share your successes. If, if you go to Allstate and you have 11 kids in the Allstate band out of one school, let the administration know that, that those successes. Um, earlier in my career, I did a monthly newsletter to my parents. And of course, as my career unfolded, that became increasingly a, a website. And so by the time I retired, it was more a website than a monthly newsletter. But, you know, letting parents know what you're doing and, uh, and why you're doing it. Uh, I think that what happens in many schools is the, the teacher, the, the music people, the staff get involved in doing what they're doing and assume that people understand why they're doing it. And, and that's a, an assumption we cannot make. Um, a couple of stories. One is we had a, a music uh, a supervisor, well, wait, a superintendent, who I think did not understand exactly what we were doing until his daughter played in the band. And all of a sudden, he was one of our strongest supporters because he, he understood or be, he came to understand what we were trying to do and uh, the importance of what we were trying to do. So I, my number one answer to what challenge, I think it's the same one. It's, it's relevance. It's showing and demonstrating that the finer performing arts are relevant and important in our culture, just like reading, writing, and other disciplines. In fact, you know, if you go back to research that was done in the, the late 70s and 80s, the, the multiple intelligences and all of that kind of stuff that moved music into a, a way of knowing about the world, uh, I think uh, that has helped. But we just can't assume that that our our administrators and our department chairmen know this stuff. If I could give you a time machine and take you back to your the your high school graduation, what advice would you offer to yourself? Uh, I, I I'm not even sure how to answer. I, you know, I, I offer advice to my young students so often. Uh, you know about this idea of self advice. I, I suppose I, I think one that's uh, an answer that's starting to emerge is is have a little bit more self-confidence. I, I think that, uh, to be quite honest, um, I, I don't know that, that I was particularly confident as a young person, um, e either as a teacher uh, or, to be honest, as a trombone player, because there were always better trombone players than me, you know. And um, I, I think that I probably should have been more confident in myself and particularly after I started to have successes because somehow I would tend to dismiss the successes. People would tell me, oh, the band sounds marvelous or what a fabulous accomplishment that is. You must be so happy or proud or, or whatever. And I would tend to dismiss those successes. And it took a long, long, long time to start to say, well, 
you know, maybe I do have something to offer. I certainly work hard enough at it. Uh, I, and you know, that's the best answer I've got. <laughs> it's a good answer. It's an important answer. <laughs> it's, it's one that I still struggle with and I'm in my 25th year of teaching. So there, there, you, go. there you go. Yeah. Hey John, in your opinion, do you think the students have changed? You know, I, I, I get asked that question from time to time. Uh, it, it's a, there's a twofold answer to it. I mean, I remember one of my mentors saying to me something like, you know, they put their, their pants on one foot at a time then, and they put you know pants on one foot at a time now. But how can you say they are the same when the, the stimulus is so different? You know, a culture in 2020 compared to the culture in 1967. You know, it's it just kids are different in terms of what they're exposed to. Uh, the way information comes to them. Uh, so in so many ways, they're different. But you know what? As I go around, band kids are band kids are band kids. You know, I've done all state bands in four states now. I've conducted in Europe. I've conducted kids in Australia. Band kids are band kids are band kids in a way. There's something that they're just the same. You know, I, I stand in front of a band that I've never stood in front of, and yeah, that's a band. <laughs> They're band kids. <laughs> the same you know? characters emerge. <laughs> exactly. But but it, it'd be silly to say that kids are the same, uh, you know, in terms of what motivates them uh, in 2020 versus what motivated them in 1967. I think kids are the same. The world's changed around them. Yeah, yeah. I guess you're saying it better than I do. No, I don't know. I, I don't know about that. I just was thinking about it as, because <laughs> you know, I was as I was preparing for this interview, I was looking at the picture and I, the picture of you when you're a brand new teacher in 1967, working with those kids, and and it just reminds me of the kids I work with now. You know, the same age group, and it's the it, you know, at some point they're kids. Yeah. By the way, that one little trumpet player in that picture played in the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. No way. <laughs> and the opera and ballet orchestra in Pittsburgh. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Now I need to go back and look at that picture again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what we never got to, Mark? And I know we're out of time, but one, one of the things I feel deeply about is developing and maintaining uh, mentor relationships you know, seeking out. In fact, this would go under the category of advice, but telling the, my students when they arrive at their new job, find out who the most successful person is in that region and meet them. <laughs> you know, go have, take them out for coffee. And, but uh, developing, and on my website, sounds like you've been on my website. Mm -hmm, sure. But if you notice, there's actually on the right side a mentors column where I have photos of the five important mentors in my life and why they are important mentors. And um, in fact, anybody who might want to find my website, it's easy. It's johnathompson.com, all lowercase, Thompson without a P, johnathompson.com. And uh, they they can look for themselves, but uh, you know why these people were important. They're all deceased, you know. Now none of them are. I can't call them anymore, but they were around for me when I needed them. So I'm sorry we didn't get to that, but maybe in a way we did. I'm going to leave it right where it is, and and people will okay. hear it. People will hear it. You know why? Because people want to hear that the answer to the next question. Everyone's always interested in this one, but I don't want your I don't want your favorite piece, John, because I don't think that's a good question. What I want is the piece that's most meaningful. And so, if you had a choice, what would be the final work for Wind Ensemble or Band that you would want to conduct or hear or maybe even perform? <laughs> you know, I thought about it because uh, I saw the question, and um, the answer is Lincolnshire Posey. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have to think about it because um, it was one of the first pieces I was introduced to because I played it in college um, with Dr. Strange. Then one of the first workshops I went to was with Fred Fennell when he was doing uh, the, the summer 
conventions and we studied uh, of course the whole suites and things like that like everybody does but we delved into Lincoln Traposi it's such a unique work you know there's nothing quite like it um, and then I learned I did it a number of times in my career and each time I did it I felt I was bringing more to the table than than the last time and so it's a favorite piece. It has significance to me because of some of the performances of it. In fact, believe it or not, my first Midwest in 76, I did three movements of it, the three easy movements. <laughs> but I did it, you know, and so it has sentimental importance, you know, and there are lots of pieces that, you know, Peter Menon, Canzona comes to mind, you know, certainly the whole suites. The E flat, especially, but the F2, you know, folk song suite. Because when I was entering the profession, those were the masterworks that everybody studied. It was Vaughn Williams, it was Holst, it was Granger. And there's always been a special place in my heart for Granger, you know, all of his music. But, but the, semin, uh, the seminal piece in my mind is, is Lincoln Chaposi. Is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Well, um, not really, because, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat in a retired state, semi-retired. Uh, you know, I continue to observe my student teachers and do things like that. Uh, I do a lot of, um, of uh, clinic uh, adjudication type experiences. In fact, you know, I'm doing the John Hershey one that's done here at Hershey High School. Uh, and then I've been invited to be a clinician adjudicator at Illinois State this year, and I'm excited about that. Oh, and then in March, I'm conducting the University of Alabama Wind Symphony uh, at the American Bandmasters Association uh, conference in Biloxi. It's in March. It's just a guest conduct one piece kind of thing. But they're a very fine ensemble, and the, the, the conductor is a good friend, and so I'm excited to be part of that. So I suppose that's kind of what's going on right now. And then I'm working on two articles for the magazine. How can people get in touch with you? Well, I, I mentioned it a little bit ago about the, the website, uh, the johnathompson.com, and that's Thompson without a P, and that. I've been told I don't exist too many times <laughs> in databases because people put the P in there, but it's uh, John A. Thompson, all lowercase, uh, no dots, just everything comes together, dot com. And that'll bring you right to my website. And my, I have a phone number in there and, you know, but what, and I, I, I don't know, do other people give you their email? Okay, well, I, I'm not uncomfortable doing it. It's thompson.john at comcast.net. Again, all lowercase. thompson.john at comcast.net. John, thank you so very much for your time. Yeah, this was fun. I, I certainly enjoyed uh, talking, and I hope along the way there was something that made sense. So. <laughs> 